Welcome to Woodburn Rising. On the show today, we have a very interesting guest. Her name is Laura Sandow. She is a former officer in the United States Navy and had some very interesting experiences, and we're going to talk with her about that today. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, uh, you were in the Navy. You went in uh, as officer training and then... Actually, so I was enlisted. Oh, you were enlisted? Mm -hmm. Yes. How did that, where you, <laughs> where you went to officer, became an officer from the I, I didn't become an officer. I, I was actually serving in a, a higher level position because of my hard work and intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people, I've known people in the military that didn't want to become an officer who worked in intelligence as sergeants and upper level enlisted people. Yes. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah, it, yeah I, and I did in work in an intel field, um, so I, I had kind of both sides, but I, I really enjoyed being a purchasing officer for the Meteorology and Oceanography Center. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, where, when did you go in and where were you stationed and let's, let's start with that. Okay, well I entered the Navy in April of 2001. At the time, I was living in Dubai uh, with my husband. Unfortunately, my marriage didn't work out. My husband was abusive, um, and I needed to get away. Mm. Um, I needed training and money, and that seemed like a way to get get out of a bad situation. So joining the military joining was the military. a good choice to get It seemed like a good choice to get out. <laughs> it yeah. did, at the time, anyway. Um, this was April of 2001. Um, I went into meteorology and oceanography training, and um, in 2000, September 2001, I was finishing my training. Mm -hmm. um, a few weeks after that, I found myself in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, that was October of 2001. And I spent a couple of months there um, enjoying the quiet, sleepy base that it was at the time. And uh, So this was uh, Guantanamo Bay. Guantanamo Bay. Which, which many of us know about from the news media Infamous and now, what went yes. on. But well, you were down there prior to it becoming a military prison, which it became after 9-11 uh, and, and that process. So, so you were down there when it was just a Navy base. Correct, correct. It so was just so Navy it, was, base. it was nice and sleepy and... Uh, it and was <laughs> nice and sleepy and it, it was it was actually pretty good duty. Um, it was, you know, one of the things that hit me immediately is being in an isolated duty station. You're one of very few females. Um, it, the ratio was probably mm. 1 to 10, 1 to 11. Um, it was... Uh, of course, that's kind of true in the Navy and most military. I anyway, think it was something? extreme being in an isolated duty uh, station. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, when I would... Well, wasn't, wasn't you, you got to go to Cuba and enjoy, you were in not Cuba, Not at so all, not at no? all. No? No, in fact, um, a good friend of mine and I, we both hoped that we would get to do that, and um, I enjoyed the Cuban music that we were able to get on the radio, and the culture that I was able to, to glean from just the few workers who were still able to get on the base, um, it, it was, it seemed like a beautiful culture and I still today am hoping to go back there. Mm. Um, I'd like to do a video project in, in Cuba and uh, hit several of the UNESCO World Heritage right. Sites. So, so because of, you know, the, the conflict and their, our relations or non-relations with Cuba, you couldn't, you guys, guys and gals, right. couldn't go into Havana. There was no we could not R and R in there or anything. Absolutely not, okay. and that's why I refer to it as an isolated duty station. Yeah. Yeah. It felt like an island onto itself. Um, it was, you know, a landlocked island too. You know. So, so you didn't. Where did you go for R and R? Was there such a thing? Well, um, a lot of times we tried to go to the beach. Um, that happened. You know, with the first few months when I got there, we spent a lot of time at the beach. But so there were beaches on the base. There were beaches that, on yeah. the base. But what happened was once the detainees started getting flown in, we could not go into the bay uh, when uh, flight operations were taking place. Mm -hmm. So qu I was, um, one time that was in the zine, I was um, in the bay with my friend snorkeling, 
and the bay was closed. A helicopter comes by with a um, armed weapon pointed at our heads and tells us to get out of the water. And that wasn't uncommon. Wow. Um, uh, the base also. So this, so this though, is you went there, the sleepy base, still isolated though. Still I mean, isolated. You know, yes. and I, uh, understanding that condition, but then at some point it became this. Uh, prison. We were in prison detainees. as much as the detainees. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to a certain but, extent. But they were, their they treatment, were being was treatment was much worse. Right. Yeah. But at some point it became the, the prison. It wasn't there when you first came and then while you were there they changed and made certain areas and built uh, prisons and, and buildings for it. Is that? That's correct. Mm. Um, what happened was I was there for Camp X-Ray Camp X-ray was very exposed, um, and the reason why they had Camp X-ray and used Camp X-ray is because in the early 90s, they had about 14,000 Haitian refugees um, be uh, kept in Guantanamo, um, mm. just kind of uh, as a holding base so that before they could decide what to do with them, so to speak. So, so camp these are people that left Haiti, Haiti and wound and up in Gitmo. And they and they wanted to come to the United States. They wanted they to come wanted to the United okay. States, or you know. So kind of like the refugees today that want to come to different countries, and they were fleeing Haiti because of the dictator unrest, and arrest yeah. in, in Haiti, absolutely. And um, so that that's something that a lot of people forget about. But that's where Camp X-ray came from. It was a rundown old. Um, holding pen, basically. So was, was Camp X-Ray, was that the prison itself? Was Camp X-Ray was the initial prison that they brought okay. the detainees to. Okay. So um, when they initially opened the camps, they had to, they started building quite quickly. They started building Camp Delta and the um, camp surrounding it. Camp Delta is the main camp. Um, they actually built it on an animal refuge. Um, and near our beaches, which closed down because mm. they yeah. put the camps there. Um, let's see, uh, Camp Delta. Where was I? So, so Camp X-Ray. So they, so they opened that, and they started bringing detainees, detainees in. in. And you, so you were there. Uh, we talked a little bit before, and I think you said you were there for about a year mm -hmm. at uh, Gitmo. Correct. And you were there, so they started making it the prison camp or uh, whatever the, the correct term to call it, de detainee uh, situation. Um, so, so they started with Camp X-Ray. So mm -hmm. you're there, and then, then the uh, culture, the environment there changed because it became a prison, even though before they were holding some uh, refugees, but mm -hmm. that's a little bit different it's than different. holding them. Yes, having these folks who, and we're talking about people that were involved in 9/11, involved in the attack. Allegedly. The, okay, and the <laughs> attack on the coal and some other. Uh, allegedly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I would say allegedly. I think a lot of the people. If I've read the bios of many of these men, and many of these men are are average people. A lot of these men were actually really good people who were teachers and in hmm. positions that you know you wouldn't think they would be caught up. Um, the U.S. government did everything from offer rewards for turning people in to accepting anybody without question, um, and I think a lot of that happened to people. Um, you have to keep in mind a lot of them were in war-torn places where it was pretty lawless, and that could very easily happen. Right. Uh, so I. You know, f the fact that a lot of these men weren't tried is dis extremely disturbing. Um, I'm I'm very glad that we're getting towards releasing them now. So, so you were there in this beginning, mm -hmm. and then you left about a year. You were you were stationed there for about a year. I was stationed there for a year. So um, you like like six eight months during the detainee in the prison situation. Um, the so the detainees started being sent in in January, early January of 2002. Mm -hmm. So I saw about seven months, eight months of that. Okay, so so quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're... Well, there were 459 detainees when I left. 
Okay. Yeah. Which is half the population practically. Right. And the population went up to close Almost to eight hundred. Almost eight hundred, yes. Right. And now it's it's down to eighty three something. Some yeah. Or I thought 166 maybe a little high. or something. It's a little high. Maybe, I think 93 was the last okay. number I heard. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like y you look back on it and you look at it, you know, you talk about allegedly you're, mm -hmm. you have some reservations about um, My the time way there and yeah. how things were handled, absolutely. Right. Well, um, before I, I joined the military, obviously I lived in Dubai. Um, which was a very interesting experience in and of itself. Right, it sounds like it would be. Um, and so, so Dubai is an oil-rich country run by uh, some sheikhs who... Sheikh Zayed Al Maktoum. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there, it's a, it's a Muslim country, and we tell you, are they Shiite or Sunni, or do you say it? They're, they're so moderate in their views um, mm. that it's... It's very open to other religions. In fact, it's very cosmopolitan. Um, a lot of European expats live there. In fact, the local population, I think, is down to 13%. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, Arab expats from other, Wait, other 13 countries. Wait, 13% what? 13 percent locals, I'm sorry. Is there's really? only 13% locals. The rest of it is all expats from the Middle East or Europe or the subcontinent of India. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, so would I want to go over and live over there? Um, Do I need a lot of money? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a very interesting um, experience. I was I was there uh, really when the American population was still fairly low, um, le less than fifty thousand of us at the time. I don't remember the exact figure, but it was pretty low and. Americans were, you know, getting American businesses started. I worked for the American Business Council as a membership coordinator mm. for a while. Um, and it gave me such great, along with living with my uh, Jordanian family, um, it gave me such a, a interesting view of Islam and the Arab culture and the Middle East in general. Um, I, th I think that was invaluable and, and really has caused so much of the, the moral dilemma that I have having served in Guantanamo. Um, the men who are in Guantanamo are all Muslim. They were targeted. Mm. Right. And uh, that is just uh, it's a discrimination and it's, it's against what America stands for in my mind. Interesting. I've read a lot about that and, and read that there sounds like there's some truth to that and, and what we've done. But it, you know, one of the keeping us safe and that kind of thing and, and the 9-11 and some of the other uh, terrorist activities like against the coal and that well, kind of thing. Well, we need to stop so voting for terrorists like Bush and Cheney. So mm. um, that's what we need to do. <laughs> 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 Those are the real terrorists. Um, you know, if, and you if you want to cut that out, you can, but in my mind... No, I don't think so. Okay. I, I think a lot of people agree with you. Um, certainly the, you know, the Iraq war and, and the difficulties that's caused, and you can see where um, what's happening politically today that, uh, you know, the Bushes are kind of behind the yeah. curve in, in many respects, and I think that's the reason why. Behind the curve is putting it nicely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm trying to be nice. Um, so, uh, where, so today, let's just kind of finish up maybe with Guantanamo. And I've just read a little bit about it. I'm not, certainly not as well informed as you are. And that's why I want to learn some of the things. So, uh, today, I, I understand uh, the president's talked about closing Guantanamo, but hasn't been able to because Congress, for some reason, you know, they want to keep it open. They think it's useful. Mm -hmm. And today you say we're down to less than 100, less than 100 detainees. detainees. And some of which have been there 10 years plus yes. and have never been tried. That's and don't, and some have, have actually been 
scheduled for release and haven't been released. Most of them left, I believe, have been scheduled for release. And um, uh, there was one gentleman who recently was, was released the day before yesterday. Um, this was an interesting turn of events. This gentleman had been locked up for 14 years and was is afraid to go out into the world and denied uh, his chance to move to a different country to re be resettled. So um, we're getting to a point where these men are, are, are being let go, um, but we need to face the next step, which is how are we going to um, how are we going to these, repay these men and, and help them get them the mental help that they need after we and do such a kind thing? Kind of reparations yeah, to some degree. Yeah, reparations, definitely. So the, it sounds like you're kind of an advocate for this being the wrong way to go or, yeah. or torture I've been not against being it right ever way. since it, it, I heard this was going to happen. Uh, I've been against it the entire time. And... Uh, you know, I, I consider it a, a huge moral conflict for me. It's it's caused me um, to really question everything. Well, certainly question that activity. Yes. I mean, I, I you know, when you look at a, at a reaction to 9/11 and something, but but it's gone on for so long, and I I don't know have. Uh, have you testified in any respects about it, or have um, you no? I've given talks publicly. Um, I I have produced the zine that is kind of my statement of of my my personal experience and moral dilemma with this having served mm -hmm. in Guantanamo. Um, so you had this uh, stories of two women working in Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. in Guantanamo. Uh, declassified. I, are you one of the two women? Yes, this is um, a story of my experience and I do go into some of the things that I saw, um, some of my mixed emotions, um, and then in the next story it covers my friend who also served in Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. um, she had some different experiences. She went into the military for different reasons, for education. Um, she went in uh, not knowing what the situation was in Guantanamo and not having a background in Islam um, and also was sexually assaulted and wanted to share her experience in that that aspect which is it kind of covers the scene covers two of the most important things facing veterans I think and military these days moral injury and sexual assault these are the two most mm. unaddressed things or uh, that need to be addressed in the military are you talking about uh, women in particular? No, I'm talking about men and women. Absolutely. It, it, it happens to everybody. Well, I think the moral dilemma, I understand that. Yes, I the sexual assault happens to men and women. I mean, I was involved in the military during Vietnam, and I, even though I was in the military, I didn't agree with the situation. Uh, well, even just your reaction, that's how un unrecognized it is that there are men being raped in these situations. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that the, the assault of women in the military and at the military schools is very prevalent. Is yeah. Right. And I, I don't know what's going on with that, or we hear people and generals talking about it and saying they're going to do something, but how you change that culture is certainly difficult. It's very difficult, especially when you look at how military is trained, you know, from the very beginning. It's, sure. uh, I remember being sexually harassed in boot camp, and I look back on it and I think that was actually really good training for me, <laughs> <laughs> because I, that was, that prepared me for what I would have to face. What do you think of the, the most recent, uh, with women in the military, most recent uh, edict to come down from the military, as I understand it, is uh, women in combat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is, is that from from what you saw? You know, and, and that's this has happened since you've been in the military. Mm -hmm. What do you feel about that? Where where are we going? Is that the right direction? I think that's opinion? absolutely the right direction. I think if you have the mindset and the physical ability to do it, there is absolutely no reason why 
if you don't have male genitalia, you can't do the job as well. Um, if the concern that men will be sympathetic to women, well, that makes the man a bad soldier. That doesn't make the woman a bad soldier. Um, you know, we, we should all look at each other as equals and want to take care of each other as military colleagues um, and brothers and sisters, but that should not determine what job we do. I think some of us uh, <laughs> during our growing up period and, and uh, interacting with the opposite sex and our mothers and, and so forth come to realize that women are probably stronger than men in many respects. Well that's why the women have the children, right? <laughs> 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 I don't think men could handle that. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm kind of glad that it happened that way, but um, I mean there's certainly, you know, physical strength may, there may be some lessening there, but I've, I've, I've played women sports against women who I thought, you know, were very physically capable, certainly of doing anything, you know, they might not be able to lift two guys out of a foxhole or something where, you know, the really strong man might be able to do that, but then there are women that could probably do better than men at some of the physical uh, activities too. So I, I don't know. I, I think it's interesting and I, you know, I think there's a different opinions on it. Definitely different opinions. And, um, but, but hearing what yours is, I think it's important because you were there, mm -hmm. you saw it, you've experienced, you've been a woman in the military. Yeah. And I think that's a important piece of, you know, and, and your opinion means a lot. Okay, well, and, and it is interesting you bring that up. I had actually considered being a rescue swimmer in the Navy. So, you know, I, I was one of those people who probably could have done that and done it well. The reason why I didn't is I didn't want to be stuck on a ship. <laughs> 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 but I think women are very capable of um, training for whatever job they want, just as well as a man. Interesting. That, that's good. So, your, your experience in Dubai and in a Muslim country. Mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting today and, and um, do you, when, you, when we look at the, uh, the people that are fleeing from some of these, uh, Syria and other countries where they can't stay there, you can't live there, and we talk about vetting these people and taking a look at them, do you, what's your opinion there? Do you, I'm not saying that, you know, sh should we say no? Should we vet them more? I've heard, you know, and I, I can't disagree that we shouldn't, uh, everyone coming into the country, um, all immigrants should be looked at carefully. Right, well I think it, it should be a case by case basis. You know, they're, they're, I don't know what their restrictions are on how closely they can look at each person who comes in. But I, I think if they have the ability to look at everybody on a case-by-case -case basis, that's a great way to do it. I want to remind people that refugees have come to this country and done some great things, too. Absolutely. You know, we've had uh, people who have gone through very rough times and come to this country and, and achieved great things. And I think that that kind of advers adversity um, strengthens people. And if we give them a chance, um, many of them will step up. Well, I think we, we go back and look at the people that have been very creative. Um, Scientists, Steve artists. Steve Jobs and other Einstein, people. Einstein, yes. Yes, came from other countries mm -hmm. and, and were immigrants. Yeah. It wasn't Absolutely. that they, some many of them weren't born here. Mm -hmm. So it, it's interesting when you look at that and, and I, when we look here in Woodburn, we have uh, a large Hispanic population. and. You start, when you compare those groups, and some demographers have done that, and many of the Hispanic uh, people are entrepreneurial. They're more so mm -hmm. than other populations. So it's kind of interesting when you, when you look at that. And, uh, but it's a, it's a difficult world today, and um, I certainly thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, and I think that's important. I think, you know, you went in, you know, everyone goes in for different reasons. 
And I think you're going in and becoming an officer and then having it turn out to be a good experience, it sounded like, uh, once you be became a supply officer and you got out of Gu Guantanamo. <laughs> Yeah. But reflecting on that is is interesting too, because that's still with us today, and um, we still need to solve that problem. And it's something that needs to not happen again. That's another. I hope so. Thanks for being an advocate for that, Laura. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Enjoyed meeting you and talking with you today. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for watching Woodburn Rising.